Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Darian Pearson, and I am an environmental scientist with the Department of Pesticide Regulation, and I am uh, Sonoma County's um, enforcement branch liaison. So if you're in Sonoma County, you'll probably see me around. I have other counties as well, but um, I am doing this for Sonoma. So I would just like to say that um, I appreciate all you guys attending today, and um, I hope you guys can get some uh, good information out of my uh, presentation. And that being said, my um, presentation today is essentially all about drift. There we go. Sorry, it was running a little slow there. Sorry, guys. So um, today what I'm going to be talking about is essentially what is drift or off-site movement, um, the laws, essentially labeling statements, regulations um, on avoiding drift and kind of um, what we look for when we're out on, um, on inspections, uh, application methods for um, pesticide use, mitigation on how to avoid drift, and then some incidents at the end. So with that, let's get started. So essentially, what is drift? Um, drift is a, a movement of a pesticide through the air away from its intended target. Um, so it can be in any forms, you know, mist particles or like a gas. And it isn't limited to just agricultural activities. Drift can occur in structural settings and in non-ag settings as well. So when does it typically occur? Usually um, during an application or shortly after it's been applied. And post-application drift occurs after the application is fully completed. So sometimes you'll get like puddling and uh, with some rain, it'll, it'll end up um, moving off with the uh, runoff into like someplace that it wasn't intended. And that's what we're trying to avoid with uh, making our applications. Chris, okay, so let's go over the law. So the first law that we're gonna look at is the Food and Agricultural Code 12972. And it's basically the use of any pesticide by a person will be in such a matter as to prevent substantial drift to non-target areas. And we'll go over basic definitions of what substantial means in DPR's viewpoint, I'm sorry, the Department of Pesticide Regulations uh, viewpoint. And then there's the label, which you probably all heard your county um, ag personnel stating that the label is law. So the food and agricultural section, or food and ag code section 12973 is the label. Basically the use of any pesticide shall not conflict with the labeling. So you gotta follow the directions of the label. And it's basically the, uh, sorry, shall not conflict with the labeling registered pursuant to this chapter, which is delivered with the pesticide or with any additional limitations applicable to the conditions of any permit issued by DPR, the director or the commissioner. We typically allow the commissioner's discretion here on if they want to um, condition a permit for the growers. My apologies, my computer seems to be <laughs> slowing down just a little bit, my apologies. There we go. All right, so here's some, um, basically some label statements. I'm sure that if you all uh, made applications and you're reading the label, um, you have all seen something very similar to this, like it's a violation of federal law. To use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling, basically read all directions for use carefully before applying. Also, there's uh, other type of like application type of things that are usually stated on the label as well. So we need a buffer on this particular one. There's a 25 foot vegetative buffer strip has to be maintained. Uh, don't, don't allow spray to drift. Essentially all these things are just gonna be like, no drift, don't drift. Um, make sure you stay on target. <laughs> make sure you're looking at the meteorological conditions and everything like that. Uh, also, uh, it will sometimes allow or state how to make the application. So you'll notice here with the nozzle height is no more than four feet above the ground or crop canopy. And you're also looking at like the wind speed here, 10 miles an hour or less at the application site measured by an, oh man, I always have trouble with this <laughs> word, an anemometer, <laughs> basically a wind, wind speed uh, uh, device to measure wind speed. And also the applicator 
as an applicator, you're responsible um, to make sure that you are conducting the application in the safest way possible. That's that's essentially on the applicator. You have to um, evaluate constantly kind of the weather conditions and the conditions in general just to make those applications as to avoid drift. Here's another um, statement, especially lately, you've been seeing a lot of um, B or um, B cautions. So some products are barely, very um, toxic to bees. So you'll have, um, you know, some B cautions here. So with this particular B statement, there's exposed to direct treatment or residues on crops or weeds in bloom. This product may um, essentially still kill the bee even after the application has been made based on the residues that uh, remain on the uh, commodity that's been treated. Especially you'll see this with like almonds um, because uh, bees are so incredibly important to almond production that um, certain products will have like a, you know, if they're allowed on almonds or to be used on almonds, they'll have this uh, essentially when almonds are blooming, they'll have this bee protection policy statement on the product itself as part of the label. So because bees pollinate almonds, <laughs> they need to treat crops. Um, there is essentially um, certain types of, of active ingredients like carbaryl um, shall not be made within one mile of almonds. And this is also kind of uh, all these components with like bees. That's why we have uh, the beware policy and where um, uh, apiaries are actually registering where their, where their hives are and uh, ensuring that growers know where their hives are so they don't make applications that could uh, potentially um, kill their, their colonies. So these are just like label statements that are, that are um, things that you need to be aware of as you're making your applications in your fields. So another aspect of, of how um, the law works is, uh, with your permit or your operator right. Well, essentially your permit. So um, this is essentially a Kern County uh, permit conditions for a grower from the county. So you'll notice that all of these have like drift prevention and how to avoid that, the school buffer zones and restrictions and how to essentially meet that requirement. There's also this uh, new school notification requirement how to make aerial applications and that this is no aerial applications of restricted materials are being made within one quarter mile of residential areas, occupied labor camps, other designated air, um, areas by the commissioner. Uh, more permit conditions are um, essentially what the grower and employer, what their responsibilities are to ensure safe and um, protect, uh, protected applications. There is another condition here for the bee protection policy, uh, particular types of AIs uh, on, on what can basically be used, uh, a notice of intent or NOI requirement per the county is 48 hours typically, or uh, current, they want 48 hours instead of just 24. Some permit conditions and strict nine use and aluminum and magnesium phosphide use. So these are all permit conditions set forward by the commissioner on kind of like, if you're gonna put something on the ground in uh, the county in which you reside or have your, your operation, uh, these are things that you must maintain in order to uh, meet the requirements um, set forth by the county, or the commissioner, however you wanna say that. So the next slide is kind of, if you don't follow the label and take your due care to, uh, to follow the label conditions and the permit conditions and uh, meteorological conditions, there can be some issues. So we're trying to avoid issues such as having a large bee kill where if, um, if due care was actually taken, taken note here and this potentially was probably like a, uh, application where they either were drifted on, um, just considering the location of the bees and the dead hive is, is probably this hive was drifted on and um, subsequently the, the colony had massive 
a massive die-off. Another reason for these um, conditions and label stuff is to avoid drifting on to um, people, vehicles, property, or non-target areas and other crops that could sustain damage. So um, you'll notice here on this truck that there is um, kind of this like uh, spotting. So this is this is a telltale sign that this this truck was misted on. And so if the truck was misted on, chances are that if there's people around this truck, they were also misted on, and that can lead to a lot more issues in terms of um, developing health health issues or or um, potentially getting sick. And then you as the applicator, if it's proved that you made that application, um, there can be some consequences to, to those actions. The next one, um, this particular um, structural individual is making an application um, and some context to this picture is that the temperature outside was above 100 degrees. And according to the pesticide label that that he was, the, the product that he was using, there was actually a um, 90 degree Fahrenheit limit on uh, making applications of this particular products. So um, as a result of that, there is uh, there was some damage to the lawn, which is essentially not what the applicator was intending to do. Um, it was mostly just, I'm not sure exactly what he was treating for in the lawn, but um, this, this kind of dead, these dead areas were not um, part of what he was trying to accomplish. The next uh, picture is essentially some herbicide damage, uh, in particular, some um, glyphosate damage to some almond trees. So um, as a grower, if this was my field, I'd be um, a little irritated that I was losing out on, on um, this particular crop out of, out of these trees that are essentially very damaged due to the glyphosate application that um, drifted over and um, contacted the trees. So as I said earlier, um, as part of the regulations, so um, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are, but this is three California code of regulations. And this is section 6,000. And that's where um, essentially our department, or essentially there's a lot of definitions. So I stated earlier that substantial drift should be avoided. And I know as a uh, regulator, we have a back and forth quite a bit about how do you define what substantial drift is? And so if I'm just reading this out, it's quantity of pesticide outside the target area is greater than, <laughs> than which would have resulted had the applicator used due care. And if you can kind of read between the lines here, it's essentially stating that if the applicator made the application in a, in a proper manner, um, any type of uh, pesticide outside of what that applicator was using is substantial. So now that's also based on if you're taking samples and if there's a detectable limit, if there's a non-detectable limit, then that wouldn't be substantial if it doesn't meet you know, the minimum detectable limit from like when counties go out and, and collect samples for analysis. But there's definitely a bit of back and forth on, you know, how do you define substantial, you know? But substantial is basically, if it is there and it's not supposed to be there, it's substantial. So as we get further into the regulation side of it, there's um, section 6600, which is basically general standards of care. And as we kind of go through this, these are all gonna be summaries of kind of what the general standards standards of care, I'm not going to get into really deep into the reg of it, but um, that's definitely something if you have questions about it, um, your county ag personnel are, are excellent resources, and then they can always defer up the chain a bit to, to me, and then eventually up to my group as well. So as the general standards of care here is each person performing the pest control um, needs to make sure their equipment's in good repair. Um, is making applications in a careful and effective manner and the methods and equipment to ensure proper application, essentially that, that the way that they're making the applications, the equipment they're using is all in good working order and they have a, a great understanding about what's going on so they can make a informed decision on how they make their applications. 
climatic conditions are essentially just weather and um you know there's there's label statements of you know wind speeds uh not to exceed 10 miles an hour but you'll never get a wind speeds of zero so a lot of times if there is no wind those label statements will also say no don't make applications either because of uh, the risk of inversion layers so we'll get into that a little bit later as well so and then um, the last per, the last thing that uh, the applicator needs to look at is um, taking precautions to avoid you know contamination of the environment or drifting or anything of that nature basically just you know, do your due diligence to make sure that you're making your applications in the safest, most effective manner possible to avoid contamination and to avoid, you know, contact of non people, persons, or property. So, if we're looking at um, equipment to good repair, there's a couple issues um, that you can see here is that for this particular tractor, the cramp on here, it's leaking excessively out of out of the fitting um so it, is this in good repair maybe not good repair but it has definitely not been sealed and this is quite a bit of product running out onto the floor or onto the ground um it might not see like seem like much but this is not intended so if you're filling and you're leaking it out everywhere um, that's not a good uh, uh, having equipment that's in good repair the next picture on the on the right here is a nozzle that um, I know that a lot of nozzles are color coded, and I used to remember them on what the color codes mean. But this is definitely a droplet size that's probably not standard because you'll notice that the valves open, the nozzles here looks like it's some kind of blast sprayer, but the nozzle and the uh, droplet size is very large, so. Uh, that would lead me to believe that maybe this nozzle is plugged or isn't operating correctly and it should be replaced um, to a proper operating nozzle. So a careful and effective manner here is if you're making an application and you'll notice on this picture that on the left side of the left side of the picture, you, you notice that there is some um, essentially like a ground boom or, or an air blast sprayer going off. And at the same time, there's fairly heavy traffic uh, along this roadway. And you notice that, you know, maybe, maybe the applicator should move away from making an application to this area right now because of the traffic. And maybe there could be an issue with drifting onto these vehicles as they go by. And that's a lot of, a lot of people that have a potential to be exposed. So as they're, as the applicator, um, it's up to you, or as the grower, it's up to you to make sure that time of day, timing is all, all very relevant and important. And I understand that, you know, as you're working through making applications on your field that, you know, a lot of you guys start really early in the morning and continue until you're, you're done. And sometimes uh, those timing issues can happen. But if there's a way to kind of come back and avoid this area, it might be good to look at so that you have a good good uh, do care as to not make that turn and potentially drift on all these vehicles so you kind of notice here again that there is this um, essentially this boom of spray uh, wafting up and unless this is going to drop straight back down uh, these cars and people are all at risk of of having a, uh, an exposure event. Here's also um, another part of the general standards of care is climatic conditions. So you'll notice that this particular vehicle is a uh, blast spray spraying into this orchard over here. Um, it looks as if all of that product is being pushed back across and potentially can make contact with this vineyard, it looks like, on this side of the road. Who knows if the grower on this side owns this property, but um, the application looks as if it's supposed to be made over here. A lot of it's ending up on this side, which is a non-intended area. So the applicator is doing the best it can. The nozzles on this side of the glassware are not on, but it looks like there might be um, some wind or something 
um, for causing this to move across the road. So uh, this was probably not the greatest spot to be making the application. It should either be a row in or two, depending on kind of where, how this is or what the weather conditions are. I don't know exactly what was going on in this particular picture. Also too, the type of equipment matters. So the methods on how you make applications uh, matters. If you'll notice in this picture with the tractor, it has a blast sprayer and it's making that application to a field of corn. Um, not really sure if an air blast sprayer is the best choice in, to make an application to corn, especially that type of crop. Um, maybe another type of, of application method would be more appropriate, like flying it on or chemigating it, or I'm not sure exactly what would work. I just, the, the type of applications being made here with the air blast sprayer to corn is um, probably not the best choice in this particular instance because of the top of the crop and how much product is actually sitting over the top of that crop and where that's, where that's eventually settling out. You'll also notice in the background that looks like there's an ag urban interface here with some residences. Uh, this drifting over there is uh, not a good idea. So as we're moving further onto the regulation side of it, um, there's also the three CCR or California Code of Reg Regulations section 6614, and that's protection of persons, animals, and property. And this is essentially a summary. This is a fairly large section. So as part of section 6614, subsection A, essentially states that an applicator needs to evaluate the area in which they're making their application. So they need to look at their equipment. They have to look at the weather conditions. They have to look at the property that they're treating and the surrounding properties to basically determine, is this a good idea to move forward with my application? As an applicator, if that falls on your shoulders, you also have the discretion to make that call of saying, no, I can't make this application now because X, Y, and Z don't line up to make this a safe application. The next section is subsection B of this. So still 6614, and this is basically drift regulations. So section B, one, two, and three. So if we're going through subsection B, notwithstanding substantial drift would be prevented, no pesticide application shall be made or continued when there is a Part one, a reasonable possibility of contamination to bodies or clothing in person. Sub point two, a reasonable possibility of damage to crops, animals, or other public or private property. And three, a reasonable possibility of contamination of public or private property, including the creation of health hazard, preventing the normal use of such property. So all that basically stating is that if you can avoid substantial drift, you won't make any applications if um, there's any possibility of drifting on any person, any property, or non-target crops, and that might create a hazard. Essentially, it's just this section is stating, don't make that application. It's better not to, um, because if you do and there is reasonable possibility, then essentially you're doing something illegal. So as you look at this picture, uh, you'll notice that there is an application occurring on the right hand side and you'll notice that there are also you know essentially field workers walking down the center between two sites i'm assuming and as the applicator does the applicator know that these particular individuals are very very close to the treated field so if I'm the applicator would I want to be making an application this close to where potentially people that are unprotected I'm not seeing very much PPE on these individuals. It, is there a reasonable possibility here for contamination? If I was the inspector looking at this application, I would say yes. And I would want this to stop um, soon. So there are just a lot of things that could go wrong with this application. And instead of you know having it go wrong and then figuring out how to correct it, just stop the application and just uh, 
eliminates that possibility. This next individual is essentially making, making an overhead application um, to these trees, probably treating for some kind of um, pest in the treetop. That looks like an olive tree to me. So he's using a power blast sprayer to get up into the, to the canopy of this uh, particular tree here. And if you'll notice, he's in a residential setting. Um, he's right along the sidewalk. If I was jogging with my dog right along here, is this a good application to be making um, in a residence? There's a car here. He's making a power blast spray. Spray through. There's just a lot of issues here that I'm that uh, if I was the applicator, I would probably recheck uh, on what what I should be doing. Maybe I should come back at another time um, earlier in the day or, or maybe not use a power blast sprayer to use in a residential area. So this also, it's not necessarily just this power blast sprayer. There's also, you know, structural guys or structural um, pest control board or pest control businesses that will make applications under eaves and, and whatnot. And they also have to have um, very good control of, of how they're making those applications. So my apologies about the quality of the pictures here, but when you're looking at section B2 of 6614, the possibility of damage to crops, animals, or other public areas, you'll notice on, on this slide right here, this is in a vineyard, uh, there's some herbicide damage here. It's very difficult to see, and my apologies. But as you look over to the next picture in the middle, the dead birds here and the dead goose here, it's because in the vineyard, they were found underneath drip lines. So they're chemigating um, this field, and the chemigation was actually like puddling, where, where these birds um, drank or somehow came in contact with it, same with this goose, and they ended up past, like dying because of it. And the label statement on the product that they were using to chemigate um, essentially stated that don't allow this pesticide to puddle, um, probably because of the main reason that if it's ingested, it causes death for animals. Okay, so B3, which is essentially um, possibility of contamination to non-target, including the creation of a health hazard. This particular instance, you can tell is a little bit older. There's a school bus going um, on the right side of the picture here is a vineyard. There was um, an application being made for a dormant mealybug to this vineyard and the applicator uh, accidentally <laughs> drifted onto the school bus. Um, there was a bus driver, it was also full of school children. So when, um, essentially the, the, the school bus here was drifted on the, the, the bus driver and the um, children all experienced symptoms and ended up going to the hospital. So we're just gonna kind of go through some application methods here. Um, so if you notice here, this is an air bath sprayer. Nozzles are shut off on one side, um, making applications that looks like kind of a young orchard. Um, you know, if you're an applicator looking around, there's a manufacturing company back in the background here. Again, with an air blast sprayer, this was actually using the previous um, slide. So here's the applicator here. Uh, hopefully shutting off to make his turn around here. Um, he did it and ended up being um, a drift <laughs> incident anyways. But that being said, there's uh, another form of blast sprayer here going over the top of the vines. So another type of method of making applications. So also here, um, a sulfur application to strawberries. So essentially driving in between this, these rows of strawberries and uh, dropping down wettable sulfur over the top for fungicide use. Here's a ground application to row crops here. So just 
essentially kind of the same thing as the strawberry and the sulfur application is um, booms out um, laying down fine particle droplets of application to these row crops. We can get into aerial application methods here. So there's a fixed wing on the left here and obviously a helicopter on the right. And um, I've been on quite a few inspections where there were aerial applications made. And I have to say these pilots are, are pretty good at um, getting their swatches down pretty, pretty well. Um, but there's also a lot that can go wrong with um, this application method. There's got to be a lot of communication between the ground and the air. So another type is I haven't actually seen this device being used. Um, that I'm not saying that it's not. I just haven't seen it. So I'm assuming this is some kind of fogger. Um, so I'm not super versed on this one. I do know what's going on here, though, and that's basically a post-harvest fumigation in this bin here. So it's kind of washed out with the sun, but notice that it's, it looks like there's a bag tied off. There's probably a fume to get released in the bag, and it's just set out and left to fume um, until the duration is up, and then it'll be vented. Here's some uh, chemigation, basically. So there's product here. You'll notice the, the pesticide uh, products here. Um, they're mixed into this tank, which then goes into the irrigation system with probably back, well, it has to have backflow prevention. And then it's irrigated into the field, essentially chemigating the field and making the treatment that way via um, watering. So chemigation also, just so I can make it, um, so there's chemigation, there's flood chemigation, there's also drip chemigation as well, as I mentioned in that uh, previous slide about the vineyard and some herbicide da damage. Um, so here we have a, it looks like a shank injection for a field fumigation. Not sure what they're treating for, but you'll notice here that there's a posting, you know, to keep people off and out of the field. And this is another reason to kind of keep those contacts and exposures of just general public or anybody that happens to be going by. Uh, don't come into this field because it's dangerous. You know, notice that that's the reason why we have field postings and communications that way. And then another application method here is this gentleman right here is using a backpack sprayer, uh, potentially making a uh, uh, herbicide application to uh, the center divide. And you'll notice that, uh, you know, in a safe manner, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, traffic going along here. And finally, I've definitely seen um, some forestry activities where they're using this power blast sprayer and they'll spray up, you know, 20 to 30 feet and just um, coat a tree. Um, a lot of times for wood borers and uh, wood boring vehicles and everything like that. But um, it's kind of interesting because a lot of times these guys will be completely covered in Tyvex and a full face shield with a respirator, hard hat, safety glasses. And they just will end up spraying this and they'll end up just getting coated. And uh, it's still actually okay as long as they change out of it. And um, I always thought that if they're exposing themselves, that's not a great idea, but there's, there's nothing stating that they cannot do it to themselves. So I always thought that was interesting. Okay, so let's get into how do we avoid uh, drifting? So <laughs> here's some mitigation stuff. So as we're looking into this, um, so the equipment application is, is an aspect. So the nozzles uh, make a, an impact. So the type of size, pressure, orientation, how fast you're moving through your field and the type of volume that you're pumping onto that field. So it looks different between 20 gallons an acre versus 200 gallons an acre. So volume, a lot more volume with 200 gallons an acre. Uh, the characteristics uh, of that um, type of chemical that you're putting down affects um, how it might drip. So the chemical, how it's formulated, uh, what you're adding into your tank mix, like adjuvants, crop oils, any type of um, defoamers, anything like that um, can also affect kind of how it behaves in the, in the environment. And the weather, definitely. Wind direction, air temperature, humidity, inversions, those will all affect how that pesticide moves through your field. So looking at uh, 
environmental conditions. So, you know, it's kind of a cool little <laughs> drawing about essentially if it's over 10 miles an hour, just stay on the ground. You don't need to get up in the air and uh, make applications. So the wind can change throughout the day. A lot of times if it's over 10, um, that, that can make a significant impact on how your, how your uh, product lays on the ground. So basically, you know, how the temperature also affects that stuff as well. So wind changes, temperature changes, the temperature change could lead to an inversion layer and then the pesticide is just sitting in the air and then essentially moving up to miles away. And that's definitely not intended. Here's a fixed wing. Um, I was actually at uh, one of these. This is a demonstration to those that people are in the background. Um, they were this particular company, um, at least the one that I went on, they were demonstrating how the nozzle droplet size was um, affecting on, on where, how, the, how the product moves through the air. So um, if you are a pilot and making an application, probably shouldn't make an application if there's people just standing around like this. Um, but this was for demonstration purposes. Another part of the flying, flying stuff on is that um, taking accurate wind readings, and here's an anonym, anonymeter. I always have problems with that word, but there's an anonymeter here, right here, saying, saying basically how fast it's moving. You can kind of like, as you're kind of turning, you can tell which way, which direction. A lot of times, um, aerials will light a tire on fire just to see kind of like how the wind is moving, how they need to, you know, uh, alter their flight path to, to um, compensate for that. Or ultimately, maybe, you know, this, if this uh, smoke was laying flat along the ground, probably is too high of wind to be making an application. So it's just one of those visual cues. Another thing, too, is having good communication with the ground. Um, crew that you have there that is required to be there and how often you're checking in with them. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. I just escaped out. <laughs> Did I lose the share screen? Okay, I think it's still up. I'm sorry. My apologies. We're talking about communication. That's the very next slide. So um, essentially, as with most things, communication is key. So. Uh, the communication between the employer and the supervisor and employees, uh, the communication of that information to the applicators, uh, potentially the pest control advisors, recommendations, the farm labor contractors, as well as the field workers, and essentially the neighbors around the field. If everybody is talking, everybody knows what's going on, um, that's another way to avoid drifting. So as you notice, this is just some good practices. So just this informatic here just kind of shows like this particular applicator was kind of coming through two rows in from, let's say the sensitive side of some water, another field, so just making those applications here. So um, another graph basically showing kind of like, if you're doing conventional way, there's higher risk of draft. If you're only going inward, it, it limits the amount of, of drift that can occur. My apologies, I think I need to hurry up here. So equipment and timing is also key. So the type of equipment you're using, these have kind of um, essentially uh, blocks that as the spray is happening, it, it contains that spray. You'll notice this gentleman right here is doing it at <laughs> probably very late at night or very early in the morning. Kind of timing of when you're making applications. You'll notice here, this is the branch two structural guy. You'll see people sitting and he's making an application um, with a, a backpack sprayer, um, essentially just a few feet away from people. Notice that a baseball game is going on here. There's an air blast sprayer in the background. Maybe you shouldn't be making an application so near to a park and where children are playing. Again, another bus, um, a plume of product kind of moving towards that bus. Maybe you shouldn't make an application close to like when schools are in session or bus routes are going. Again, you'll notice here, um, a bunch of workers in the background harvesting. And then there's a aerial application made by helicopter um, on essentially very close to that field where those field workers are. Probably shouldn't uh, be making that aerial application while field workers are so close. 
so again, this was that other picture where, um, you know, choosing not to make this application in this field because there is unprotected field workers here. You'll also notice that uh, the nozzles have not been shut off as this individual is making the turn. If these particular individuals were further down and he's making the turn, uh, it's more than likely um, these individuals would have been driven off. So now we'll kind of quickly go through some some incidents. Uh, I'm not going to read everything to you here, but um, essentially, just in in certain counties, you know, they'll have they'll have some incidents here. You know, the purpose of the regulations isn't just to be um, a pain to the to the growers and make it harder for you guys to conduct your business. It's essentially to keep people safe while you are conducting your business. So when drift incidents occur, we need to look at kind of why those things occur and try to correct that issue before it becomes a massive problem. So um, stuff of, of this nature is just kind of like, you'll notice this is a, a story from July 12, 2019. The basis says drift is causing potential for more regulation. And um, we all know that we have a lot of regulations and there's a reason why we have those regulations. It's because something went wrong. So. Uh, the whole goal of our, you know, my department is to essentially, and the US EPA and the, also the state EPA is to basically protect human health and the environment by regulating pesticide sales and use and by fostering reduced risk pest management. So that's the whole issue. That's kind of like why we, we do what we do is to make sure that we're protecting human health and the environment. Those are two main, main things that we're trying to protect. So there's another incident where 60 farm workers were exposed to chemical being sprayed. 60 is a lot of people. They, they shouldn't have been exposed. If all of the labeling and, um, and permit conditions were followed, you know, if it was just an accident, there, nobody tries to make, um, make applications um, by mistake. So I'm not saying that any of this was done on purpose, but there could have been something to, to prevent this. The notice here, there's um, essentially tape of grape harvesters here, alfalfa. Um, there was an aerial application being made to the alfalfa that ended up drifting onto these uh, grape harvesters. And also, whatever product is potentially used on alfalfa may not be allowed on these table grapes for consumption. So now not only have you drifted on people, um, you've drifted onto a crop for this neighbor and now that neighbor can't end up selling this because it has an illegal residue on it. Again, just all of these table grapes are just all sitting out here waiting to be picked up. And um, if it's drifting over, all of these are now exposed and uh, potentially could not be sold. So um, as you notice, uh, the applicant, the pilot was actually making passes over the harvester. So, you know, that's, not, not good for them. So here's just another thing too, you have to have kind of a work plan when you're type of, trying to fumigate. You'll notice that there's this field is gonna be fumigated and there's all these residences. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, pre-plan application, fumigate through a drip system here. So um, essentially it wasn't, the field wasn't sealed correctly and, you know, uh, over 400 people were exposed to the fumigate because the seal didn't work. It failed. <clears throat> so that fumigate actually just like drifted out over this way. Um, a lot of people were exposed. Eventually that investigation from the county was uh, referred to the district attorney's office <clears throat> to, for essentially an enforcement action, you know, a fine or potential charges. So as we kind of go through here, it's, it's you know, a lot of this is agricultural, but it's not just limited to ag use. Structural also occurs. So you'll notice this applicator is uh, spraying directly onto seats and chairs. This is um, just no. Um, there shouldn't be making this application when there's such, um, such potential here. So, and this is another applicator that was making applications. You'll notice this, these wet spots along this edge here. Um, first off, this seems a little far out. Um, this is a 
impervious surface. Um, this is all structural kind of lingo, but um, he's making an application. Um, these are kind of non-target things that could be affected by him making this application along this wall. So um, as, a, as an applicator, um, probably either shouldn't have made the application around these plants or should have moved them away from the wall to make that application and then you know, move them back or just left them off to the side. So essentially to, uh, according to the notes, this applicator also made an, the application on like dog water, food bowls, patio furniture, and some children's toys. So there was a lot wrong going on there. This final picture is there's um, a koi pond. And if you know anything about koi is they are extremely, extremely expensive. And uh, these ones definitely look like that. So um, applications that are made like around this um, that are potentially um, highly toxic to aquatic life. Um, a lot of the structural type of type of um, applications or products um, are toxic to aquatic life. So if you have potential to run off from this from this um, patio into this pool, all of these coys are dead. So that's or or have potential to to die or be exposed and become very ill. And uh, it could have been avoided by just following the label and the law. Again, this is just kind of stating that there was an application um, inside here uh, of this particular uh, eatery where um, it was a branch true, um, essentially that the product that the, the structural guy was gonna use was uh, don't apply when food was being prepared or being served. The branch two um, guy was late, ended up um, asking people to lift their legs while he was uh, making applications uh, in the restaurant. So uh, many people complained of illness after that. Um, probably shouldn't have made that application while the restaurant was open. In fact, he couldn't because it was a, a law issue there. So maybe starting early before before the uh, restaurant opened would have would have avoided that. Okay, so here's a uh, fumigation of branch one. So, um, you know, a lot of this stuff, there's not a ton of these that occur, but um, in terms of there's the structural fumigation incidents, uh, sometimes there'll be like no secondary locks on the doors, um, essentially that the, that the structural company controls. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that people can't break in, but the secondary locks are basically like, you don't have a key, you can't get in your own door because there's a secondary lock on that door that you do not have access to. So and sometimes as well, there's incidents of drift when the aeration doesn't work properly. This, um, you know, vent spout here isn't properly uh, open, it's pinched, the fume again ends up leaking out somewhere else. The uh, snakes along the bottom here to create that seal aren't properly working. Um, there's rips and holes in this tarp. Anyway, there's there's um, lots of issues that can occur there. So, so uh, this is the air blast sprayer where um, essentially there was a crew working in this field. Um, they stated that you know to start off with the uh, weather conditions are perfect. Um, the application needed to be made when there's wind speeds between three and ten p.m. or three three and ten miles per hour. And then there was a solar farm just outside of the area. So you'll notice here the application site is almonds. There is a new construction for solar over here. The application commenced, and um, essentially about eighty individuals were exposed. Um, first responders were called, and about 40 individuals at the solar site were exposed and taken to the hospital. So uh, in the end of the application, the, the commissioner of this particular county found that the applicator was in violation for drift. They should have made a better choice on making that application. So um, some incidents here are um, with particular non-ag settings. Notice that this individual first off isn't wearing the appropriate PPE, <laughs> should be wearing gloves, making applications to these rocks. Uh, that is okay, but you need to make sure that you are um, 
utilizing this backpack sprayer in the appropriate manner. So not too high of pressure that can cause the droplet size to shrink, which then causes higher surface area, lighter material. It can then move off site. Same with this other individual. He's also not wearing enough PPE either, but we're not talking about that. Again, here's a Japanese maple. Uh, looks like there's some herbicide damage to it. And it's kind of tricky when you're looking at this. I, I got to hand it to the county for this is uh, for their investigation because if you'll notice here, there's exposed roots. The weeds here that were supposed to be treated, um, the roots then got exposed, which caused this damage. So uh, this is a well-established and mature tree. I'm sure the homeowner was not super stoked about that. Again, more herbicide damage to this particular tree. I'm not sure what this is. Uh, looks like it's another maple first. I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Anyways, and here's a sago uh, showing symptoms of herbicide damage, you'll notice it here. It's pretty much just dead. Same with this one, herbicide damage. So, so um, just to kind of review with what I've said is uh, basically I've defined out what is drift. I've gone over the laws and essentially the label because the label is law. Regulation and policy. Policy would be more like permit conditions and regulations are going through those uh, California code of regulations as well as the food and agricultural code. We talked about some incidents talked about methods of application, and then ways to mitigate drift. So I appreciate all of you guys for sitting through my, my presentation here. And if you have any issues or would like to uh, talk to your county, please direct your questions to them. And then also, um, they may have access to some of these small pocket guides. Our department has since stopped printing these, but they may have some copies left for you if you'd like. And if you have any questions um, after this, uh, please direct them to your county agricultural staff. They are very knowledgeable and uh, they will uh, definitely help you answer your questions. There, there is a resource for you as well. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Darian, for your presentation. Okay. We have a few more minutes um, that we can take some questions and Michelle, it's your turn. Yeah, Darian, there are several questions for you in the, the Q&A. Um, the first question is, could you please comment on drift while using sulfur dust? Okay. So um, in terms, uh, are, are they asking how to mitigate drift with sulfur dust? Uh, is that what the question was? Um, the question just says, could you please comment on drift while using sulfur dust? It's an anonymous attendee, so I'm not sure okay. what they meant specifically. Um, well... There's also a, a secondary question from someone else that says, can you address secondary drift, i.e. volatization drift as well? So the volatization is going to be a, a gassing off. Um, oh. So I guess my biggest thing here would be if you're using, you know, a wettable sulfur, uh, which is, I'm assuming I'm talking to somebody that's uh, uh, grape grower or something like that and have to use sulfur to, for fungicide use. As far as, as far as like getting that sulfur onto your plants after like a rain, um, I guess I don't really understand the question super. I, it, drifting is just, if it's any kind of product, if you're blasting it out and it's not settling where you need it and want it to settle, um, that would be an issue to, to work with uh, that might be an adjustment to your equipment, adjustment to the type of method you're using to make that application. Although I don't know of a lot of other ways to apply sulfur to grapes. Um, I know that there's certain types of like fumigants that use sulfur dioxide to fumigate um, wine barrels. Um, that's usually done in like an aerated area, not enclosed. Um, as far as a vapor, um, as as you make your application, there's going to be certain half-lifes that are, that are maintained here in soil, water, um, photo, the fo photo half-lifes where uh, products will actually degrade over time. 
they'll gas off or they'll metabolize out. Um, I'm not sure if that's what the that question was trying to address as um, far as like vaporization or volatization. We are out of time for questions, sorry. Um, we have to move on to the next presentation. If you're able okay. to, if you have a moment and able to click the, the Q&A tab, you can yeah. see the questions that came in. And if you're able to continue answering them, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, I certainly will. Thank I'll you. I'll do that right now. Thank, Thank you, you for so your much. Presentation. Of course. Thank you guys very much.